sorry, I will allow Alexander here to join. And other. So, welcome, uh, the rest of you guys. Like I said, neither Michael or Sarvan has been able to, to join us today. And there's really no problem with that. They are excused, of course. They have, they're entitled to some lead time. So, again, uh, this is presentation of the integration user group, former connected systems uh, group UK. I will today start on, oh, hi, Mike. <laughs> Good. So I will today start uh, talking about something like uh, I would have uh, I've called the fall of the Bistock architect. And from something abstract to something useful, I will also try to not only bring down the Bistock architect to earth, but also try to present to you, to you uh, ways to how you can mend your ways and become a better uh, Bistock architect and integration architect call. This is of course sponsored by Bistock 360. And here we go. I also wish I could pop these guys out of the way. So, um, of course, we're trying to keep the momentum of Integrate 2014 going, of course, and we used to be going this uh, about this at the same time every Monday. And all sessions should be about integration. You can uh, use this to engage with MVPs or the uh, product teams and generally also with the, uh, the community. And the reason for that being, of course, that, well, this is what we want to do. We are a community. This is how we, uh, how we roll. People are from other products. Hello, Leon. Uh, other uh, from other product teams are quite envious of this kind of level of community that we have. So also, of course, try to engage with each other. Use the Twitter hashtag Integration Monday. And also we have a website and an Eventbrite site, of course. You all know this by now, I guess. And if you don't, please ask someone that seems to know. So this is my presentation. And I think I will start now and I will do one of these as well. So uh, once again, the sound check, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Otherwise it would be very strange for a couple of minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, and also um, this little window I have down here, can every, everyone see this, this chat window? Yes, I think I have to, all right, I'll, I'll move it to the other. Another screen. Oh. All right, I'll simply toast that down because you know. All right, so the fall of the Vistock architect from something useful to, to uh, from something abstract to something useful. And I'm trying to use a clicker here. I'm sorry. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. So who am I? My name is Michael Sand. Uh, as you can see, I have a blog on WordPress or Azure because I'm cool. Uh, and I also have a, a very avid Twitter account at, at Michael Sam. I live just south of Stockholm uh, in Sweden, and I recently also turned 40. This has had very little effect on me, of course, other than I now constantly look at uh, young, red, cool sports cars. But other than that, nothing. Uh, I'm also a senior integration architect and Azure associate at Enfo Systems in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, yes, this is the company that uh, Johan and Mikkel used to work for. And also, yes, I have moved away from CGI. From quite some months ago, people have been wondering, actually. So let's move on here then, shall we? Uh, I will do a short preface thing here because I am and I've always been working as a consultant. Therefore, I also will use the term client or customer all the time. So if you don't have a client or customer, just exchange these words for Clive or Susan, whoever orders your new integration stuff from your office where you work. I'm also trying to make an effort to present everything and in a very clear black and white manner. And I would simply say everyone or all or always there, well, but you all know that there is some room for discussion, of course. I also might sound very cynical when I do this, and I don't do that because, well, I just do it for, for dramatic effects, and it's simply easier. So, 
All I'm saying is that I would say this once now, and you can fill in this disclaimer every time you hear something that might sound like you need a bit of nuance. And in that way, we'll all save time instead of me going, well, you know, but this, in this particular case, it might be a better fit for every, you know. So moving on, what is important? Or rather, what is important in an integration? I have found five things that are important in an one thing is that it looks good. It really is. An integration should look good. It solves a problem. It connects two or more systems. Well, come on, this is basic A-level stuff, Michael. And it works. <laughs> it's a fairly basic thing. And also it's reusable. Might be one of the things. And out of these things, which is the top five uses for us, I would say that the most important thing of these five is that it works. So it's do, doing by posting. Now, that gives us something to think about. It's not that it's cool looking or that it might be a nice technical solution or everything. Because this is our world. And systems are sending their data. They are depending on us. And, and, and we are we're in the center. We always Planets ourselves in the center, and it's even called middleware. You know, we see ourselves as the center of everything. And as a matter of fact, we might even see ourselves as a bit more for this. And this might not even be far from the truth. However, sorry, pause for dramatic effect while letting people in. How do others within the enterprise? view us. So it's time for one of these, Michaelisms. And these are a set of, of, I don't know, slogans or whatever. I'm not writing a book or nothing. Uh, it's called Michaelism because Sandisms sounded a bit like uh, some kind of dictator in Chile uh, in the 70s. So a Michaelism, Michaelism number one is that you are an expense. If you're not working with BizTalk to print money, you are an expense. You're not making money for a client or employee. employer. The only reason for being there is to lower expenses. So if you haven't realized this and also have a very, very big BizTalk ego, you're going to have a bad time. And pause for dramatic effect again because I need to let Leon in. So you're going to have a bad time. Sorry, I have a bit of technical difficulty here. Sorry, so you're going to have a bad time. And the reason for that is that if you have this big BizTalk ego and you think that you're in the center of everything and the guys around you only view you as something that's not, you're going to have a bad time. So looking at expenses, this is a small business meeting. It's just an example of something that I, I had. The uh, sums which are going to come up are in Swedish and they might not be internationally viable or anything. And if not, view them as numbers, nothing else. This is a real thing and not at all unusual business meeting that I attended some time ago. There was one employee here. Sorry. There was also one meeting room. That was nice. We had some coffee. Very, very nice. We were five consultants. Hmm. And we sat down in that room for two hours. How do the business view this meeting as a cost? Well, the employee is employed. He or she costs eh, for this project zero. We had one meeting room. The meeting room is always there, so it costs zero. And we didn't have fancy coffee, we just have coffee from the coffee machine. So that's zero. However, the five consultants costs, well, this is not a lot of money. There were a lot of juniors and some seniors as well, but we were five of us. And five times out of 870 Swedish crowns times two is about a thousand euros. So that is just one small meeting, a thousand euros. So now it's time for Michaelism number two. Perhaps you might not need to motivate your very existence and you are you should be happy if you have people 
around and above you that know exactly how important you are and how exactly important the work you're doing is. But you might even have trouble to get love from other colleagues within IT. So please, do not think that people are as good at this as you are. This might seem very, very egomaniacal, but think about it. You have special skills or powers. You know this. And you can do this because you did it before. However, I've often met and seen other integrators and they say that they know exactly what they're doing, but when you ask them exactly what is sent over the wire because the soap header seems kind of whacked off, then somehow they respond, we have no idea because we use a tool and we generate Java classes and yeah. So you might be better at this, but you need to help them understand. I mean, no one has ever been motivated to be steps on. Help, don't tell people, that's one thing. A technical solution might be very, very clear and obvious to you because you've worked within this field for a couple of years, but that in itself might not be good enough for everyone else. So make them understand, that's what I'm saying. So are we the center then? I mean, are we even the center of an integration? I would like to pose this question because are we really? Let's see. So we are <clears throat> doing an integration project here. We have a basic receive file, transform it and send it somewhere else. Nothing special, it's nothing new. But then again, who are involved? Well, of course, the Vistok architect, he or she is, of course, in the middle. It's called middleware. But then there is like a developer perhaps another developer from one of the systems, one system owner from the receiving system and the system owner from the sending system. And then we have the enterprise architect that is also involved in this. And we also have the application operation guys, of course, we don't, we don't cannot forget those guys. And we have technical operations as well. And operations owner, oh my God, he knows everything. And then we have the custom representative somewhere as well. And we might have a tester and a product manager and more product managers, of course. And then the security guys, and then in the end, also, we have some kind of user. Now, every one of these people have their own demands, wishes, wants, and everyday work life. And when the integration is done, it's their reality that dictates what is okay and what is not okay. So every one of these people have one thing in common, one wish and one demand, that it works. There are some exceptions, of course, and I just want to point out this in order to avoid a riot. People does not want it to work. They want it to be secure. It's not always the same thing. And then again, EA architects, well, they want the integration platform to be a box with EA diagrams. But other than that, people want it to work. So the user of your integration could not care less if you use the deployment framework and the project managers utterly uninterested in that it's a very cool ESP solution. So another Michaelism, and just to hammer it home, make it work. Perhaps we're starting to realize that we are not the center of the known universe. We cost money, we're only a small part of an integration project. How does the company organization view their integration platform then? Here's an almost real customer systems landscape map. They have an integration platform. The question is, can you find it? Unless it's business critical application, and I can tell you that it's not. So if you're really lucky, you might even get an integration map. And this one is not far from the actual truth. Missing from this is they actually also put in the different kinds of data that was transported within these or in integrations. And still, there is no integration platform. Who are we? Let's make up some statistics on the spot. I, I think in about 90% of all cases, clients, users, a person who ordered you the job, they could not care less about what kind of framework you're using, the naming conventions or anything like that. 
you might be allowed to give them one hour lesson on a loosely coupled integrations thing, and that's it. But then you need to do something that costs money. You have to motivate. Users are really the number one representatives in this. They are almost always only interested in one single thing, that it works. Only after it works can you start to focus on cool things like BAM, monitoring, automatic error handling, and all the other cool stuff. If the file that passes through the system uses one or two integrations, they don't care. So then let's look at BizTalk Server as a product. We're very funky and dynamic. We're adaptive, even compared to other platforms. We can do a lot of specialized and funny stuff. And we use a lot of cool protocols. And this brings that we are often viewed as the ones going, well, you decide. The customer wants to connect systems and want to know, they want to know how. And this is just usually frustrating for them. So remember the Michaelism that says, don't think that other people are as good at this as you are. If you want to make a, if your company wants to make a new integration, it's usually something like this. The web is sending something to the backend system. The backend system is sending it to the printing firm. And this is the way they draw it. Solid, well-defined blocks with well-defined processes on how different things are done within the system. And not even we view this as something strange. And then they realize they need BizDoc to do the integration stuff. So they draw another box. But if we start acting like this, we're not exactly going to be the flavor of the month. We are perceived like this every time we do not have answers to difficult questions quickly. Connectors. Connectors is just one example of this thing compared to other platforms. We might, we are here, we here might think or have heard about the API apps, and, and they are connectors, but connectors are not a new thing. Customers might be looking for a service that is like, oh, we're, we want to connect to this governmental agent, agency or, or this large corporation. But we, the BizTalk developers and architects, see this connector thing as quite an alien concept, as we are so close to the wire all the time or the protocol. Other platforms might say, yeah, we got a connector for that. And then we have to go, how do you want to connect? But this is another thing. What part of an integration product takes the longest time? And this is a rhetorical question, don't answer me, because the, re the answer is, of course, the preparations. The stage well before any development takes place. And we're quite good at developing integrations by now. We've done it for about 10 years or even longer. The time from spec to tested code is short. The big part is not development and configuration, but rather the preparations. And if we do not facilitate preparations, but rather go, well, you have to decide how to do this, we're problem bringers rather than problem solvers. So, Michaelism number four. If you want to be rich and famous, present the solution, not the problem. Bosses love that. So that old saying, if you want a new computer, don't say, I want a new computer. Go to your boss and say, hey, I want this new computer. And you will most likely get it if you're good. So who are we then again? So we are expenses. We're rather small in the big scheme. Of we are invisible and many view us as an unnecessary step in integration. And we flail about and we speak a language that people doesn't understand. And what is the least we can do? Say it with me now, make it work. How? This is kind of a turning point here because now I've been tearing you down for, I don't know, 15 minutes. Oh my God, time flies. I will try to rebuild you. And now I will present, present this thing you heard since my friend. I mean, the thing that covers the most ground with the least effort. Then again, 
from now on, this might not be perfect fit for all of you, especially if you already have like a framework in place. But then again, you would not have agreed with the problems I've presented so far. So in my view, this is the best possible solution if you have a bit of chaos or if you're looking for your way of doing things. So this is what you need. Structure, architecture, and the right mindset. This is the solution. It's not magic or the latest and greatest tech from your favorite company. It's as simple as that. A predefined way of working in an open, more customer-centric way of thinking about a problem. Be part of the business, not the odd one out. So what do you get then? You get predictability. You get quick answers to complex problems. The integration is very complex, but using a structure, you can have predefined answers to question. This is that might be very complex. And then, like, what kind of way can we use to connect to an external partner? Structure also means processes, and processes gives you predictability. The answer to why do we have processes here is not that we want to know what people are doing, it's rather I want to know what's happening. If I send a mail to my IT guy, I know that I will start a process and I will predict that in a couple of minutes, I will re receive an email saying they have registered my email and they will start working on the issue. It also gives you kind of a measurability. You can measure your workload. How long do we think this thing will take and how long did it take? And going to the business centric side, again, we have quick answers. And we have processes that leads to predictability as well, as well. But in this case, you can decide, decide what the process is and make them jump, jump to your, your hoops. And lastly, we are very abstract in what we do. Not a lot of people understand why we do this and why we think the way we do. So in the end, a way of working might be just a little bit more concrete. Now, you might ask yourself, this is nothing new. No one disagrees with this in any case. Then again, why do so few work like this? And also, I'm just getting started. So it's time for definition. What is an integration? There are more definitions of this in the world than the world can handle. But I think I will add this one, and it will be the silver bullet. It's roughly the same information is moved from roughly the same system to roughly another system. And before we move to the next slides, I thought I'd explain a bit because we're always using the same kind of boring financial data or purchase order. So I think that might be a bit hard to understand some points if you're either new to this talk or accounting or order forms. I thought I would use something that everyone can relate to, uh, alcoholic Beverages. So oh, this is the information type. It's beverages instead. So this is definitely one integration. System A is sending beers to system B. Once again, notice the lack of a BizTalk box. Also, one more thing. The arrow beers is not the integration. That's the information flow. So it flows, in, flows beer from system A to system B. The whole thing is an integration. Now, this is also the same integration because system A is sending roughly the same information. It's just a subset of beverages, beers and wine, probably the same. Yes, let's send it the same way. It's just another type of data. And this is still the same integration because we're sending roughly the same data to about the same system. So system C also wants some beers. Who wouldn't? Now, this is where it starts to get tricky, and it might depend on how the client ordered the integration, but and how they see the future of, of system D. But if you see empty bottles, it's not beverages, but it's kind of close, and it depends a bit on the beers thing that gets from the system A. So use your head. I mean, is it a good idea to keep these flows connected within an integration? And how is the last flow related to the information type? The client does not care if it's two integrations or one. So why do I define integration like this? Because it's how people see it. 
people that ordered the integration and are paying for it see it as this. And integration is not system A0002 is connecting to service SRV00023 using contract C00002. If you start saying that, people will fall asleep or get mad for not providing the solution, but rather giving them a new problem, trying to understand what the hell you're saying. But try instead to have a bit of humble pie and sit down, relax, and ask them, what do you need? Well, we, we need to send invoices to our clients. We, we want to deliver batch files to my CRM systems. Well, an integration and what people order are not the same, but it tends to be that because it's how they see it. And if they can see it like that, then perhaps you can do it. And this is perhaps the place for a BizDoc architect at how do we split or merge the, uh, what the client ordered into our existing landscape? Is this a new integration? Is this uh, an add-on to an existing integration? So, I can't leave you without going a bit more concrete. So this is the big reveal. This is one, I'll tell you how to solve 90% of all your BizDoc architecture problems, and I don't even think I'm kidding when I'm saying this. So this is the solution, the atomic integration. The atomic does not mean indivisible. And the atom is very splittable, as we all know. Here it means that it's contained or isolated. It's more like the atomic and this doctrine can still be atomic sense. But what is the atomic integration? The integration has to contain all its parts and have as few external references as possible. This also means that you clean up after yourself. And it means that you duplicate schemas other artifacts if you need to. Yes, it costs two. The integration will contain everything to be buildable and deployable. This means that you get to get, get to wave bye bye to the shared project and the large DLL libraries. However, don't be stupid. Do not take these two and then run into the wall with it. If large schemas that will never change with any, any in any way whatsoever will be used throughout the integration platform. Like if you have Microsoft CRM on one side of it and every other thing on the other side of it and you're using this doc to make these things talk to one another, then of course you will take the Microsoft CRM schemas and put them in a shared, in a shared application because not doing that would be stupid. And don't be stupid. Duplicate the artifacts and use code reusability with copy and paste. Wow, copy and paste. Hmm. That seems kind of odd, you might say. No, it's not. Imagine you, uh, you type in a, a Bing slash Google search and you, you turn up some code. How do you reference that code? Would you ever think you would reference that code by referencing it? No, you would copy and paste it. And you say, well, now this code is mine. I will use it at mine. And if you view your, your large component library in the same way as your company's repository or perhaps Bing site, then it's not that, it's not that, uh, not that big a deal, actually. So once again, don't be stupid. Be an adult instead. This might be the most important thing. But all architectural ideas can be abused as well as used. Just be an adult about things and don't take my word and run into the wall with it. The atomic transaction the integration will give you one integration that is one Visual Studio solution that correlates to one stock. And it gives you one MSC for MSI for deployment, deployment. And now you need to, you can just use your MSI. And people that work with installation love MSIs because they know what they are. Or you can use like your PS script or whatever, but it's one thing. It's also one set of documents to support it. 
is one common name for the integration. And this is related to like how business and AIT tells each other about what's wrong with it. And you have one entry into a repository. And lastly, of course, is that you have a very simple to an otherwise very complex problem. I've seen a lot of solutions to the problems around this talk architecture, and some of them are really good and very useful. However, they always contain some kind of technical caveat and code base that needs to be maintained in order for it to work. The solution, this solution does not need that. It's ready to go out of the Bistock box. So the integration, atomic integration also gives you an easier follow-up thing because it's very well defined, it's very well contained, and, and you have a better fit with sprints in the agile method because you have a well-defined workload, so it's easier to follow up on. It's also a very, very good fit for the ITIL, ITIL or ETIL method because the, uh, the method of, of having um, incidents and problems and tasks gives you a one-to-one -one relationships between the integration and ETIL artifact. And if you have well-defined integrations and independent each one another, you can depend, develop them as well. So a single developer can take responsibility for whole integrations, which gives you better quality code. And also, when you have this predictable way of building your things, you also get easier add-on de development. You know how everything will look in production. You can simply make an add-on for it. And overall, it's a very much easier way of deploying your code. You simply move your MSI file from dev to test and from test to UAT and from UAT to production. There are some downsides though. There, you may have very large solutions and it may be hard to cooperate within the team. Um, nothing is perfect, not even I. Not even, not even I. Uh, large integrations with a lot of different systems can cause large solutions and make it very hard for developers to cooperate within a team. And if you have double the info, yeah, it's double the info. Then again, it's a nice feeling of control in isolation. It's nothing scary. And yeah, it might not be a perfect fit if you want to build a proper ESB. I mean, you can do it using this method as well. You simply make, a, you make a, a couple of integrations, everything to be loosely coupled, but it might be harder to do. But then again, ESB was never easy anyway. And lastly, it, yeah, it's a bit boring. It is a bit boring. It's framed, it's well-defined solution. Basically, it's already done when you've got the dev spec. Someone needs to do it basically. So this is the a uh, structure within this doc. I'm going to show this in a demo soon, so wake up. So the integration name is a number and a friendly name. The friendly name is, of course, decided on by the uh, integration team and the guys that order the integration course. Artifacts are separated by type using subfolders within a project. And this is very good in, if you want your entire integration to be very, very isolated. So you have just one single DLL to deploy. Some drawbacks to that, of course. Or you have one uh, artifact per type. This means that you usually have like system A dot schemas or your system B dot schemas and system B dot transformations. And the upside of this is that it's it's more granular. It gives a bit more control over the de deployment process. You can patch in, uh, you can patch update um, transformations if you want to. <laughs> Orchestrations, place them as uh, shared and make them shared within the integration, not in a shared thing, uh, shared application in BizTalk. Also use hardbound ports, standard, and hardbound ports are the ones they we, that we also call specify later by me. And copy and paste pipeline components and helper code. This is once again, might be a bit controversial. Once you've done it a couple of times, you realize that, yeah, this is very, very good. There are some drawbacks, of course. You, well, if you have a pipeline components that everyone uses, and you discover that there's something wrong with it, you need to find out who ever is using it 
And for that, you use find in TFS and you work through your, your source code. Of course, you have to patch a lot of instances of it, but then again, if everyone is using it, why the hell isn't it properly tested? Once again, don't be stupid. Michael is in number five. Don't be stupid. Don't do stupid things. There are stupid things which I've seen, and I, for a short amount of time, won't go through them. I'm very much a fan of standards, now special settings or configurations. Um, don't get me started on like, using XSLT. Yes, I know it's better in some cases, but oh my God. So let me illustrate. I need to get even more concrete. We have a mission here. This is what needs to be done. And this is something that is handed to me, um, not very far from the, uh, the actual truth. This is in Swedish. I will translate for it. So the uh, VVD or the web uh, actually gets some kind of orders and wants to send it back to the business data. And the business data sends a batch file to printing. And it says, send from web, collect on business data. And this is what I usually call the uh, something like a napkin drawing or something. So two guys meeting over lunch. This can also be called an integration initiative. And after some research, we arrive at this visual drawing. The website sends orders from, for new cards to our backend system. The backend system sends a batch file to printing once a day to order new cards. And we see this as one integration and we give it uh, a name. It's called intbug001 card transactions. And we are using a bit looser name here and just order new cards because, well, perhaps we could build on this integration sometime in the future to update or reorder cards. And of some more fun, we arrive at this. We uh, see that someone will send something and we have to decode the JSON. We have to transform it and then flatten it. And we have to send out an order in a batch file format. And then we have the batch file that sets the name on the outgoing port. And this is when it starts to get interesting for a lot of technicians here. But then again, this is also when we lose the other guys. So don't show this to the client if they don't want to. So who are the stakeholders then? Well, number one, the web guys. And the website guys are, as you know, guys that were, were, uh, were wear hats inside and has uh, scarves inside as well, although it's you. And then we have this, the sales guy. He really, he's really hoping for this one. He knows that things will be very, very good, but he has forgotten to turn on his computer. And then we have the backend system. It's probably Unix-based. And we probably have some Oracle thrown in there for good measure as well. And this is the guy. We all know who this guy is at our particular enterprise. It's very good. It's been working all for 30 years, but they have their way of doing things. And then we have the printing guys. And the printing guys have a limited budget. They need to do everything in a very, very special way and fail an entire batch or accept an entire batch. And then and somewhere we have the guy or girl that's in, in the IT pro that has to support our integration and we leave. And they usually tend to wear fleece. So let's, let's try to uh, make a demo uh, out of this then. And let's see here. So yeah, it's, it really is, I think, finally. So this is not in, not very special or anything. I will just show you the uh, show, show the solution. It's called Intbug001 card transactions, like we said. And we have binding files here. I personally have um, a little make the years file. But then again, here we can view the different parts of the integration quite easily. Starting from the bottom, and I will walk through this. We have, you can see you have int001, that's the integration of course, and then we have the web, which in Swedish is called webben. Therefore it's webben. And then it's the artifact type, so it's schemas. This is schemas for webben. It's not hard to find. 
also, since we prefixed everything with the integration number, we know that it's unique because the integration number is unique. There is no other int 001 Debian schemas ever, nor ever will there be. So it's, it's unique. And also, if you have all these in your global assembly cache, you can simply order by name and you get all the artifacts related to int bug 001. And here we have schemas. And of course, we have uh, it's a it's a cool JSON schema because I I'm 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 hip and young and I want to use hip and young things. So it's JSON, of course. They all the guys with the hats inside always use JSON. And there we have some pipelines as well. We have a receive part, receive the uh, JSON. Nothing magical here whatsoever. But we simply have a JSON decoder and then an XML disassembler. Don't forget to put in the XML disassembler. I did. I cried for a long time till I found out what was wrong. And then I cried some more because I felt stupid. So JSON decoders then. You could argue that much like a flat file disassemble pipeline, you can you could just make one flat file disassemble pipeline, deliver or uh, deploy that, and then make everyone else reference it and just simply use configuration. That is one good best practice and JSON decode string might be the same thing. I'm just saying that. So once again, don't be stupid. So WebM sends to the backend system and they have schemas here. Of course, it's a flat file schema. Of course, it's a flat file schema. It's old, it's Unix based. And then of course, we have the pipelines for that and we have a transformation that transforms the different then we have the total the new information flow that sends information from print to to print from the backend system. Of course, I had to do something here. So what I did was I introduced the fact that we needed some kind of special pipeline component. Now I won't say show you the actual code of this. Dude. So but what it does is that it uses the file dot receive file name property right to that so that on the send side I can use that and then configure the pipeline component to be a bit more smart in how to use different kind of properties. You know, I, the send file name macros uh, in this talk is not exactly very good. So basically what we did was to build our own way of, of customizing date, uh, date strings. So this is what that does, and that's what we need for it. So what I did was I visited our large factory, and I went in and I did a copy paste. So I started copying here down to namespace, from, and then I just simply pasted in here. And by doing that, I made the code mine. So now the code is mine. Only I need to, need to worry about it. For now, that also uh, had a couple. Of, it had a helper method, like a couple of helper methods, like read property back. I copy pasted that as well. I also actually removed a lot of helper code because I didn't need. It. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, how we do that. And one of the cool things which I pr personally like doing is that when we deploy this pipeline component, we usually do that by placing it. Uh, in the uh, component uh, pipeline components folder, but then we need to deploy it to BizTalk. And one way of doing that is using getUtil, or we can do another cool thing. So here is the uh, my my test environment, or rather my development environment, and you can see as well that this is very bogged down at the moment. And here we have the thing. Well, it's called in bug zero zero one dot code transactions. Yeah. I wonder which code base that might be. Yeah, it's an ironic but very cool thing. So here we can find everything we need. And one of the cool things you can do is to go in here and go to resources. And here you can see that we have something called Python components. And the cool thing about this is, is that I can make that a part of the MSI. So when I tested everything here, I want to export my MSI for, for import into the test environment. So I will simply do one of those, you know, export MSI file. Now, if I go like this and I find the pipeline components DLL, 
in pipeline components here. I go like this. I get C stream. Add the, to the global assembly cache on the add resource. Yeah, I might want to do that right now, but I won't. Add to the global assembly cache on MSI file import. So if someone imports the MSI file from this, they will also install it into the global assembly cache. That's exactly what we want. So, and also add to the global assembly cache MSI file install. So that's when you uh, install the uh, install the thing. So, and now I will I will just click cancel. But it's here. It's there. And if I export the MSI file, it's in the MSI file. So if I move my components up to the test environment, it's still in the MSI file, and it will be installed in the testing environment without using any special scripts or anything. So just because it is a Microsoft demo, you have to actually show something, and it's not at all impressive, nor should it be. If you are impressed by that, by this, you, you have some serious issues. This is not about doing something cool. This is by showing how something simple should work. So we have a test environment here. We have a new card .json. It's a JSON file. It's, they sent the new card, card type one, and it's gonna start today. And it's for me. So I copy paste it. Hello. It goes into the backend systems inbox, and lo and behold, here's one I made earlier. Here, this is a very, very Unix-friendly and Oracle-friendly system uh, format, of course. And then we have this kind of thing. We have a batch file here, and if I simply go and copy paste it here, it goes out to print. Test and you can see that it's actually it has rewritten the uh, the um, the file name here to um, to mirror uh, the uh, date and time. And also, I can see I'm running short on it. I'm sorry. Well, the demo's over, so that's one. So make sure that the error information is sent to the right people in the way that the person can understand. This is moving away from something that I was supposed to illustrate, but I won't. So this is one of those other things which I'm, I'm very, it's very important. Just make sure of this when you make your integration. Don't just push it down to the, uh, uh, to the uh, torch guys, but in fleeces. Make sure, don't think, how will I make this work? Think instead, what will happen when it fails? and then send the error to the person that needs to know what to do with it. So moving on a bit to the cloud. So we are coming up here on, on Azure App Services or like the next solution. This is the answer to everything right now, so Azure Place. So, so usually using API apps and local apps, we can connect these capabilities without even having to think about how. But let's Create a new application by using some auth and, and hashing, perhaps some integration with Facebook, some new cool stuff we did, and the backend system. And now imagine all these services and APIs and calls together and doing that without some kind of thing, architecture and structure. Yeah. The atomic integration works for this scenario as well in the version next. And we need to have some kind of order in the version next because they are aiming for the developer of the next integration is this guy and we have to make sure that he knows that he has turned off his computer but what have you learned here we are not the masters of the universe we are small compared to the rest of the enterprise we are a service we should function as such we have customers, they should be treated such. We are perceived as too complex, too granular. We have too many wants and needs, but there is one way out of this. Structure, architecture, the right mindset, and then of course, the atomic integration. 
And by that, it's actually the end of my slideshow. And uh, if someone wants to, they can perhaps uh, pose some questions using the chat uh, now. Uh, I can, you, you could send me an email at michael.sand at info.se or visit me at michael.sand.se or use my Twitter account at, at michael.sand. Ew. Um, yeah, like I said, Michael, um, it's a good thing. It's, it's also about integrating people as, as well as integrating systems, of course. Uh, once again, try to be, um, try to be customer centric in the way you go about this and don't go straight on through the technical stuff. If you are a person that likes to go into the technical stuff, then perhaps you are more a developer than you are an actual uh, integration architect, I would say. If you are more like the ones that, than me that actually like to sit down in, uh, in a meeting room with some guys and girls and just listening to what they need, then you, perhaps you are an integration architect. There are some, of course, some people that might not agree with me, and I, I very, very much respect that. I have no problems with that whatsoever. I know that this works. I've used it for a couple of years back when I was at, at CGI. And I continue using it at Enfo, because it's basically what they've been doing all the time. And we have quite a lot of success, uh, success actually, um, uh, using this. And from a biz talk, uh, from more from a biz talk, of things, I would like to say that the the um, the solution architecture and the copy paste coding is basically what saved my proverbial as a million times. Because if there's something wrong within my integration, it's usually wrong within my integration, and I can do some things about my integration without disturbing not disturbing other integrations because it's isolated. So, and it might not be, you know, the thing I said uh, at the start,